Hello and welcome back to Pharmacist Diaries. I'm super excited today as I am recording an episode with a wonderful pharmacist and entrepreneur, Georgina Fahosi. So today we are talking all about her journey into pharmacy. She has experience as a hospital pharmacist and is currently working for Novartis. So I'm really excited to share and showcase her journey from a hospital role into industry. She is a mum of three beautiful little children, um, so I'm always excited to speak to other mothers who are working within pharmacy and enjoying that work-life balance that we all try and cater ourselves to. And the most exciting thing is that she is an entrepreneur and has a company called Afro Touch Design. And this is a greeting card publishing company. So she's been selling all sorts of greeting cards for the last eight years um, and has, building, has been building her brand over the last few years, which is really exciting. And we're going to showcase that on this journey. And she's been so kind to share a discount code with you guys. So she's offering 15% off her cards um, with the code FARM15. So that's P-H-A-R-M 15. And you can just put that into the check out um, in the little code box and you'll receive your discount code and um, I'm really excited to kind of share her journey so let's dive into it. Welcome. Hi. Oh, this is so <laughs> exciting. Here we are in half term. I Everyone know. needs to know like <laughs> mum life, work life but also an opportunity to enjoy ourselves. 100%. Um, and get to know other people and not just in our kind of normal community but pharmacy community as well so um i'm really happy to have you here i'm excited to be here thank you i'm really grateful that you've taken the time and also you've traveled quite far to come and visit me and spend some time with me so um really excited to um showcase your story on the podcast cool so let's dive into why you became a pharmacist in the first place my my favorite question of course i i kind of fell into it i think i knew that I always wanted to do something that was going to help people. I wasn't sh quite sure what that was. But when I uh, did my A-levels, I did law, psychology, chemistry and biology. So it was either going to be a lawyer or something in the medical field. I knew I definitely didn't want to be a doctor, um, but I wanted to do something that was, you know, in that, in that same field. So I went to America and I spent some time with my uncle, who's a pharmacist out there. I spent just a, a, about four weeks um, with him in his community pharmacy, came back and thought, yeah, actually, I think I would quite like to, to do pharmacy. And that was literally how, how it all happened. Always thought that I would be a community pharmacist. Never thought I would do anything else. Um, went to university and I did that sort of six week placement um, at, at Boots, I think it was at the time. And just didn't, it wasn't for me. <laughs> and then I thought, okay, I think I was, I liked the clinical side of things. So I went into hospital and qualified um, and did a hospital rotation and it just kind of went from there. So nothing too exciting, but yeah, I kind of fell into it and, and it's, it's been a career so far that I've, I've, I've enjoyed so far. Absolutely. And it's really, it's really nice that you um, shared that you, kind of saw what a pharmacist does in community or retail in the US, um, came home, studied pharmacy, went into a placement and realized from a career point of view or mm -hmm. a day-to-day -day working, I'm here nine to five every single day. It wasn't quite the right place for you to enjoy and thrive. And this is really valuable information actually to share on the podcast simply because we've got students, training pharmacists, mm -hmm. early careers pharmacists who tune into the podcast. And you need to explore different areas and sectors of pharmacy. It's actually a good thing to understand what you love and what you don't love. And I'm always saying to my students that go out and get yeah. placements and internships because you will find out what type of pharmacist you want to be simply by shadowing and watching what other people are doing or exposing yourself to an environment where you can see yourself potentially working mm. there. And I worked in retail. I, actually, my parents owned a pharmacy for, <laughs> for a couple of decades. They're not pharmacists, but they were business owners. So I grew up as a teenager and, you know, 11, 12 year old yeah. in the pharmacy using the manual like pricing gun and stock checking and, and seeing 
what community felt like. Even my dad walking down the street to the car, it would take us about 30 minutes because so many people would stop him in the high street to say hello because of the way that his community pharmacy was focused on yeah. helping people. He would have conversations with every single person that he knew that came into that shop. And that's what he built his kind of um, business ethic yeah. around. And I see that myself in him so much because doing a podcast now, it's all about community. Yeah. It's all about networking and meeting people. And when I worked in retail in as a student on weekends, I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed getting to know people who lived in that neighborhood. Mm. It was an independent pharmacy, really personal. They used to come in there not only for medications and help in terms of health and well-being, but we had a whole bunch of um, nice uh, products that we could sell, yeah. perfumes and things. So buying gifts for people was a big thing. And, and you really get to know the individual, their family members, what their life is like. And that was something that really um, sat with me for a really long time. But when it came to the actual role of a pharmacist and what you were doing on a day-to-day -day basis, I felt that I wasn't probably as challenged as I wanted to mm -hmm. be. And the type of services that are available in a hospital and what your day-to-day -day life is like in terms of multidisciplinary working, making an impact on that patient's life mm -hmm. in that moment was just so much more intriguing for me. And that curiosity made me feel like, let me try it as my pre-reg year yeah. and see what the difference is because I don't have, I didn't have much exposure yeah. to it as a student. I didn't have any placements really that I did. A, I think it was two or three days. Um, I spent most of my time in, in community. Yeah. So I was like, oh, let me try and get a hospital pre-reg and just kind of see what it's like and then kind of make decisions. Obviously, I'm still <laughs> in hospital. So clearly I loved it. Um, but it, it sounds like you had a similar experience. Yeah, I, I mean, I... I really liked the the business side of pharmacy. I liked when I when I first went to it. I I always thought, okay, I'm gonna own a pharmacy. That was the I saw my my uncle in America with his his own pharmacy. I thought I'd come back, you know. That was the goal. I was gonna you know be a a, a community pharmacist, have my own pharmacy, and I think that's probably where the the first bit of kind of entrepreneurial ship sort of was the seeds were were sown. Um, but yeah, I just didn't enjoy it, and I just thought. I, it didn't, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to experience, you know, maybe what a speciality would look like or, and that kind of thing. And same as you, I, I hadn't had any hospital experience, only what I'd, what I'd seen at uni. Um, so my, my thought at that time was only, or what I knew was only, you know, community pharmacy. Um, but I, I, I was born in Bristol and moved to Portsmouth. I studied in Portsmouth, and I knew that I didn't want to go back to to Bristol. I didn't want to stay in Portsmouth, and this was my opportunity to go to the big city and do and and live in London. So I chose a pre reg um, based in in London and, and moved to London and never looked back. <laughs> I love that the the big city life is really fun, especially when you're young and you're kind of free to enjoy work life and your personal life as yeah. well. And it's quite exciting to move somewhere where you might not know that many people and you build your own friendships and network and you build your own life away from like your parents. And um, that independence is is really fun and enjoyable when you're at that age. I've moved to so many different cities for <laughs> me. Like I just love the adventure. Yeah, I have no fear going to live somewhere new and not knowing anybody. In fact, I really like it yeah. because it gives you an opportunity to explore what a new city or a town has to offer and meeting different people. Yeah. Um, and obviously living abroad has been one of my most kind of favorite elements of my life and, and just exploring what international life has to offer. Mm. Even when it comes to friendships now, I've got friends all over the world because all of us have gone to Dubai or Abu Dhabi to live yeah. for a few years and then a lot of people have moved back home. Um, so I know people, you know, in Ireland and South Africa, New Zealand, who've kind of all explored and we're so fortunate now to have social media to yeah, keep in touch, yeah. which is really nice. So what was it like as a hospital pharmacist for you? What were your, what was your initial journey like? And, and then kind of what were your thoughts in terms of your um, career journey? 
Yeah, so I did the um, sort of whole basic grade rotational thing. So I qualified, um, I did my pre-reg at King's College Hospital um, and sort of did the whole rotation. So went to, went around all the different specialities. And then within about, I think a year and a half, I did the, the it was a buff um, clinical diploma. And I was working in paediatrics at the time. And I really loved paediatrics. Um, so I decided that really early on I was going to just stay and <laughs> do paediatrics. Um, so I managed to sort of get a band seven um, permanent role as a paediatric pharmacist um, and did that for a little while. It was it was sort of a paediatric, split paediatric and split women's health. So I did, I did both. Um, yeah, so I did that for a little while. And then it got to the point where I thought, I'd quite like to go and experience a different different hospital and and see what what pharmacy was like outside of outside of King's because I'd, I'd worked at King's by that time probably about four years or so um, and then I moved to UCL and did cardiology it's a completely different um, speciality but really really enjoyed cardiology um, and really enjoyed being a, in a different hospital meeting different people, different ways of, of, of working. And then I got bored. <laughs> and it was at the time where um, it was just starting to look at um, sort of population health and um, looking at managing health on a wider sort of wider scale. And PCTs um, were, there was a new thing around having pharmacists working within PCTs and that sort of thing. and. I remember going to it was a um a royal um pharmacy um society meeting and they were talking about PCTs and commissioning and all that sort of thing and I thought oh that sounded really interesting um maybe it's something I I I could explore um so I left um UCL and ended up getting a job at Haringey PCT at the time as a prescribing advisor. Interesting. Did, yeah. I'm going to stop you for one <laughs> second because I've got a question on being bored. Okay. Because it's really uh, useful to dive into that because when you look at a community pharmacy role, your day-to-day -day is pretty much similar to... Yeah, it's similar every day. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it any better than that. You are exposed to a very similar environment and your routine is pretty much the same every day. Obviously, you get different types of patients and exposure to different prescriptions and mm -hmm. over-the-counter advice and everything, but your routine is the same. And in a hospital job, when you're rotational, there's lots of variety. And I want to bring this up because it's really interesting for people to think about this from their career point of view and why they step into a hospital job. Yeah. When you're a band six, like me, I did my residency and every three months I rotated to a different specialty. Yeah. And I have found out um, from just a lot of reflection that I need variety in my life. I 100% need variety in my life yeah. to thrive. I'm currently working in paediatrics. I obviously work in academia at King's College London, plus I'm doing the podcast. Of course, I'm my mother. I include that as a job. <laughs> um, so I like the, the the variety and being able to chop into different things and use different skills as well. Yeah. And um, I, it's definitely part of my personality to enjoy that. And when you do um, your rotational job, it allows you to have that variety because you're constantly exposed to change, right? Mm -hmm. you're, you might one month or every three months be on a ward, but then you might go to medicines information. Then you might go to um, a, a clinic setting and, yeah. and be working in a clinic. So you're constantly evolving in your role. You're constantly learning. You may be doing night shifts or on calls and you're also doing your diploma. So there's a lot of change. But when you get into a band seven role, which is maybe what you experienced, you love pediatrics, you liked women's and you thought, yeah, cool, I'm going to specialize because I enjoy it. Yeah. But your day to day pretty much becomes your day to day. And this is something that I think is really valuable to talk about because I feel quite similarly if I'm in doing the same thing every single day, 
as an example, if I put myself as a palliative care pharmacist and Mm -hmm. I had to do that five days a week, I think I'd also get a little bit bored. And maybe you could tell us a little bit about that story of boredom. Like, what was it that kind of triggered you to feel like this isn't enough or I'm not necessarily challenged as much as I want to be or was it a skill, like I'm not using enough skills that I have that I would like to yeah. Kind of use. I think I just I think to your point I just I missed the variety I felt like every day was the same sort of thing um I was kind of coming in doing the ward rounds coming back down going into the dispensary doing the the the, the, the checking going back up in the afternoon and it just seemed like the same thing every day and I just I was looking for something else and I think I got to the point I'd I'd also at that point um was due to get married so as life was changing for me at that time and I didn't want to feel I started to feel like I was a bit I was getting stuck and I felt like that was the time it was it was now the time to, to try and look for some something else I could have gone to a different speciality but I felt that it would probably, I'd get into the same routine. It would be, okay, I'd, I'd, like, like I, I moved from pediatrics to cardiology, got into the same routine, doing the same sorts of things. Um, and that, that's, at that time, I, I just felt, you know, it was, I needed to do something, something else. Um, and that was why I felt, you know, moving, maybe moving into commissioning would be a completely different, it was a different experience. And that's how that happened. So, yeah, I think, I think when you, when you're used to the, when you're a basic, a, a, a junior pharmacist and you're going around, it's exciting. You get to see different things. You get to experience different, different things. You get to speak to different doctors all the time because of different specialities. But then you get to a point where you specialise and then it's the same conversations, the same people, the same. And I'm I'm one for variety. I can't stay still for, for yeah. too long. So, yeah, I think it was, I, it, it made me feel I need to see what else, what else was, was what, what other options there were within pharmacy. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing wrong with that. And mm. that's, that's actually, it's good. It's good that you figured that out. For some people, they just stick with the job because they feel like, well, this is, this is what yeah. I've got on offer. And also, also put it, this is what I know. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I know this. I know cardiology I know all the drugs I know everything within it I'm comfortable Mm. um so why why should I leave I can stay but there was just something sometimes when there's that niggling voice in you that's just there's something that's rumbling that's something sometimes you have to kind of just listen to that and then make that make that move because Mm. otherwise you will feel stuck and it's better to make those moves when you're kind of earlier in your career um if you can um so that you get used to that change you get used to okay if a situation happens in down the line you can just pivot if you need to because you've done it before yeah and one good thing about pharmacy is that when you're in these types of roles like one piece of advice i could give to people is look out for secondments as well because actually there are so many things that are available to us in the nhs so if you're a hospital pharmacist and you're You've been doing a cardiology specific band seven role for like two to three years and you get to the point where you feel a little bit of boredom and you need to explore. Look out for different fellowships or the leadership fellowships that are out there, the clinical entrepreneur programs out there, um, the chief pharmaceutical officers fellowships are out there where you get exposure to different experiences, different skills. And knowing that you can bring those skills back into the role. 100%, yeah. Will really help you to develop yourself as an individual, to kind of spark that interest back in you. But also you might get exposure to things where you end up leaving, um, (laughs) you know, the current role that you're in, which your employer will know is a possibility. (laughs) Um, But if you are one of those people who likes the comfort and sticks to routine and, and you thrive in that area, but you do get a bit bored, I would also say that it's really valuable to think about what projects people are doing in your yeah. department and and just tap into them. Or even if it's not in pharmacy, I got involved with research projects with some of the doctors that I worked with. I wanted to get exposure to learning more about research and getting published. Mm-hmm. And I didn't really have anyone in the pharmacy department who was working on it anything specific so I just reached out to the doctors and said is anyone working on anything that I can support 
yeah, I did it in my own time. I, yeah. I, I did like half an hour in the morning before work or an hour after work every now and again. And this is when I have had children and I've been on my prescribing course. So I was putting in the extra time, which actually my boss probably wouldn't have minded if I did it during mm. working hours, but it just became easier to set it into my routine. But that also helped me to gain more skill. Yeah. But also... um bring in that variety that I needed because I find that a lot of band seven pharmacists similar to your story is that they move or they think the only other option is to step up to an 8A mm. and instead of thinking laterally and transitioning to a job where their skill set is suited but it's a completely different position they automatically think that the only option is to step up mm. when they're not actually probably quite ready for it but they think that's the best transition for yeah. them in that moment. And I see a lot of band sevens who do struggle with the daily mundane routine. And for me, it helps me to kind of say to them, well, actually, are you in the right place? Yeah. Are you in the right specialty? Are you in the right rotation that suits your skills and your interests? Or cool, do this rotation for a year. Um, but then, you know, like long term, you might not want to be exposed yeah. to this specialty and and you make the right choices for yourself. It is so hard, but at the same time, we are so lucky that we've got so much available to us because I don't think that there are loads and loads of careers on, in this world where yeah. you have the option to chop and change as much as we have the ability yeah. to do. So it's um it's good to to kind of expose yourself to new areas, but it's also then good to listen to your gut and listen to kind of where your interests are and and pivot when you need to. So tell me a little bit about the PCT role in itself. Like what what was it that sparked your interest in terms of the actual role and, and what did you end up doing with it? So it was, I liked the idea of working in primary care. It was something that I, I didn't know anything about, but I liked the idea of sort of talking to GPs about prescribing. It was a different audience, I guess. Um, sort of going into practices, talking to them about their prescribing ha habits. That was something that intrigued me. Um, also the sort of the opportunities to work outside of a hospital setting. So it was working in office space, you know, working with other people outside of just pharmacists. So it was working with managers, um, working with people that worked in community care, um, different different areas of, of, of healthcare, not just solely a specific speciality. Um, but I didn't know, I, you know, I didn't know anything. Um, but I knew that there were skills that I had learnt within secondary care that were transferable so all of the clinical stuff that I'd learned I could transfer into the knowledge that I was going to you know provide to, to to GPs that even going back to sort of the rotational piece it was you kind of feel sometimes you're you're jack of all trades master of of none in a, in a way sometimes as a pharmacist but that's helpful because I could tap into different elements of what I'd learned and, and share that with the with the with general practice yeah, so I think it was just the fact that it was a different environment. It was something new. I could learn from, not just from pharmacists, but from other people within primary care. Um, and I loved it. I loved working. We, we were, when I worked at, in Haringey, um, it was a, a very mixed, diverse team. Um, I had a fantastic sort of manager, fantastic a fantastic team of people that just nurtured me and, and, and sort of pulled me along. Um, I loved working in an environment where it was the the community of people that lived with it. I worked for Haringey. So, so Haringey as an area was really diverse. There was lots of health challenges and it was sort of that's problem solving and trying to work out how do we sort of help the the health of the population in that area what are the things that we can do um that really i guess that's kind of sparked my initial interest into serving people at the margin serving pe serving people um at the greatest risk of ill health um and doing that not necessarily just directly through giving them a tablet 
but actually thinking more strategically about how do you do that um, from a population perspective. And that was the bit that I that really I I I, I really wanted to explore. Nice. And what was your day to day routine like? So I managed my time, which was good. Um, I had a patch, so we were given a, 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 a an area, um, say for uh, it was probably about you know fifteen to twenty, probably a little bit more GP practices that were mine, um, and I would be responsible for um, going to them, looking at their prescribing pra- prescribing habits. To, we would have something called a prescribing incentive scheme, um, which was to sort of incentivize the GPs to make better decisions when it comes to prescribing. And so I would monitor those prescribing habits. There's also stuff around sort of writing guidelines. So I was really involved in writing local guidelines, um, working with, still working with secondary care, um, but looking at um, you know, dermatology guidelines or local guidelines around minor ailments, that sort of thing, writing them, bringing people together um, to to put these guidelines together. So that was really um, interesting. And also we attended things like um, drugs and therapeutic, drugs and therapeutic committee meetings or local prescribing committee meetings. So a lot of it, it was, it was very different to being in a hospital environment, um, but it was more, what I really, really loved about the experience of being in um, in an office space and being amongst other people was just the the ability to learn from other people, the ability to learn about, if, for example, talking to a GP receptionist about the the day to day runs of primary care. I'd never had experience from that of that before. Um, talking to, you know. Um, managers within community um, services all of those things I hadn't had exposure to so it was just I it was it was being able to just walk a different a different direction and and and, and do something different um the days were never the same um one day I could spend all day in a GP practice another day I might be in community pharmacy because part of my role was also at that time when it was PCTs, community pharmacy contracts were under the PCTs at the time. So I'd also have community pharmacies that I'd also go and, and talk to. Um, and we used to do, we used to do um, sort of the assessments for, for, for pharmacies. So that at the times so I'd go in and, and talk to pharmacies. So it was, it was very, 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 very different. Um, and I moved from Haringey to Southwark after I got married um, and did a similar role, prescribing advisor role um, within Southwark as well. Um, and yeah, again, a very it was an all-female team when I moved to Southwark, which was different. Um, but again, very, um, just a, an opportunity to to learn. Um, yeah, it was, it was a, a, a good time. But again, I got bored. <laughs> I'm loving this theme now. <laughs> I got bored, and um, I at the, t- at the time I'd moved to, so I was at Southwark for for a while, and um, I had my second maternity leave at Southwark, um, and maternity leave is great because you you know it it's an opportunity to to kind of step away nurture your child but also you get to have some time to just reflect and and to think and I did a a lot of reflecting and thinking whilst I was on maternity leave and we'll probably get on to it but that was how um the business idea came came to be um and I remember going back to work after having my son I sat in my chair and I just thought to myself can I really do this for another 20 years? Um, And the answer was no. And within a week of going back, I handed in my notice without knowing what I was going to do, but knowing that this wasn't it for the rest of my kind of working career. Um, Yeah, and I never, I I, I didn't, hadn't, I I thought, you know, I'm a pharmacist, there's going to be jobs. I can, if I, if I could either go back into hospital or I could do locum, I could locum and the plan was I was just going to locum and then work it out. And I remember handing in my notice, not knowing what I was going to do, but my manager at the time 
said, have you ever considered pharma working for the pharmaceutical industry? And I said, oh, no, I don't know anything about, about pharma. Um, and she said, well, I know somebody that's just made the transition from um, hospital into pharma. Would you like to have a conversation with him? So I said, oh, yeah, 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 let's have a, have a conversation. And we had a long talk about what his role was. He was working, at the time he was working in a market access role. And I was like, market access? I don't know what market access is. Um, and we talked about, you know, what he did. He, he said, I said, oh, I don't have, I, at that time I felt, I don't have the skills. I don't know, the, I've never worked in pharma before. I don't know what, you know, what I would even do. Um, the only sort of roles that I knew were, the job rep roles because they were the one the people that used to come and see me in my in my commissioning role. Um, so he said he would if I wanted to have a conversation with his the head of market access in his in the organisation, he would set that up for me. So um, I went and spent and about an hour and a half with it, at the time it was the director of market access and. I literally remember just going into the office and sat in front of her and I said, this is my skill set. This is what I can do. I said, what roles align? I, I don't know what roles you have, but what roles align with what skills I have? I've worked in commission. I've got clinical. Um, and she said, oh, um, we haven't got roles at the minute, but I think you'd be really good in a patient access manager role, which is a market access role. It's around, you know, supporting access for new innovations for um, for patients. And so she said, we don't have anything at the moment, but I'll keep you, keep you in mind. If anything does come up, um, I'll let you know. So we also talked about me the, the medical side because within pharma, you've also got medical affairs. So medicines, information, um, medical advisors and that sort of thing. Um, so I could have done, done either or, but I think at the time I was really sort of driven towards the, um, the patient access piece. Cause that's something that I felt more comfortable with. So I went away. Um, and then as it would have it within two weeks, a job up a job came up south london patient access manager role what seriously <laughs> seriously <laughs> within two weeks and she didn't say anything at, in in that moment and suddenly the job came up did they did they let you know about it or did you just randomly I, find it randomly <gasps> i know <laughs> that's so cool i know so I thought, okay, because I actually I had applied for a um, medical advisor role because that had come up. So I'd applied for that, didn't hear anything. So I thought, oh, you know, yeah. just, that's not for me. And then this role came up. I can't even remember where I saw it. Maybe it was on LinkedIn or something. I can't remember. Um, and I applied and then I got shortlisted. And um, yeah, I went for the interview um, they wanted to know all about, you know, my role as a pharmacist, working within um, all of the different aspects of, of, of my kind of pharmacy career. And um, yeah, I got the job in, in pharma. We have to rewind. <laughs> I've got like 20 questions now. We've gone so far ahead. It's all good. I love that you're like, you know, uh, in your flow state in terms of telling your story. And it's great. Um, and I love that you shared your day in a life, you know, as in, in the PCT land. Um, I love that there was lots of variety. You could choose what you wanted to do kind of each day of the week. And I also really like that there was lots of service improvement and kind of project management in that role. At the end of the day, when you look at that role and prescribing practices, you're looking at, you know, um, cost efficiency, mm -hmm. you're looking at are they making the right choices, the the kind of formulary, what what you're actually supplying from the community pharmacy point of view. So you're you've got a lot of kind of communication in that role and networking with different individuals from different places and at, like you said outside of pharmacy so yeah. it's, it's really um it sounds really interesting it sounds like you can utilize a lot of skill that you've built from your hospital journey in a yeah. completely different environment and you were learning so much about what primary care was like you know yeah. it wasn't something that you were exposed to and you were getting that insight and being able to use even things like your guideline um 
development. That's a skill you already had probably as a hospital mm -hmm. pharmacist or you had exposure to. So you kind of knew how to do that. And that was very kind of detailed, probably desk work. But then you've also got the variety of being able to move around, maybe travel a bit to different GP practices, do maybe virtual calls as well as um, face to face, but probably back then we more didn't have, face yeah, to face. We didn't, it was, yeah. it was a lot more, lot yeah. more face to face at that time. Yeah. So that's really interesting, and it it sounds you know like a um, um, a really enjoyable um, role. And you also got to work on your own and do your own thing, which is very different to hospital life because you are pretty much told what to do in terms yeah. of a rota in a hospital job there's very limited flexibility especially if you're a band seven yeah it is very much a clinic or reward based role for multiple hours of the day you still have your kind of dispensary slots and things mm -hmm. that you know your um or even afternoons entire afternoons where you're in the dispensary where you cannot really go anywhere but to the toilet yeah. <laughs> and come back and um you know you're you're doing your job and yeah. and the day's done right and as rewarding as that is when you've got freedom to choose your kind of hours be where you want to be when you want to do it like with entrepreneurship there is something else <laughs> about that and if you're like me and you then that is something that you will love yeah and once you fall in love with it it's hard to kind of go back to that old routine and I'm discovering that um I don't like that trap of the rota yeah I don't like being told you need to be in this location yeah. from this time to this time for some reason it just doesn't sit right with me anymore um it's totally normal part of the job there's yeah. nothing out of the ordinary um, but for me now, I've explored what it's like to choose my own timetable. It's very difficult to go back. There's something powerful about yeah. management of, of your own time. I know. And you being able to still do the role, but do it in a way that serves you. Mm. You know, I, I miss saying part of the role was around education. So I could, I might be asked by a nurse, can you provide some education on a particular topic? then I would then, you know, write that and, and deliver that. So I could sit down and strategically think about what I was going to say, what I was going to do and deliver that. And nobody's, no one's told me to, you know, it doesn't have to be in a certain way, but it was it was me formulating it and doing it. So just that management of time is, is, yeah. is so powerful. Yeah. I think as a junior pharmacist, as a band six or seven, the structure of the rota and being told where to go, when to do it and having like, okay, you've only got four hours to do the ward and then you've got dispensary. Yeah. That structure is nice because it tells you I have to get shit done yeah. basically yeah. in that time frame, yeah. have my lunch and then I've got to be a dispensary pharmacist and that works yeah but if you're if you do get bored easily um then obviously that can be quite triggering because you feel like you don't have time to explore yeah anything else and you're kind of expected to do it in your own time which is why i think a lot of band seven struggle sometimes because they want the time and they expect to be given the time or it's roted into the schedule. I've seen this mm. on countless occasions. They want dedicated scheduled time to work on projects, do research, audits, education and training, leadership, yeah. e-learning, whatever it is, because they their rota is so packed during the day that they are forced to do it in their own time, which they think is unfair. And I agree with that as well. Um, it's it's a fine kind of balance. Yeah. Um which is quite hard as a manager to try and figure out how to make that happen and make everyone happy as yeah. well. But when you come out of that and you're also problem solving in a PCT land and you're kind of, the service is driven by the issues that arise as well and the prescribing practices that happen and what people are doing. So you're kind of, you've got the kind of creative freedom to figure out what problems you want to solve. So like, if a nurse comes to you and says, hey, we think we're lacking education mm. in this topic, you're like, cool, let's fix that. Yeah. Boom, done. Like, I'm, I, I, can, I can do that. I'm allowed to do that. Yeah. I've got the time to do it. And I can spare these two hours to work on the content. I can do it over the lunch breaks and, and boom, make it happen, right? Yeah. And that's rewarding. That's quite nice that you're like, okay, you've got a problem. I can solve it. Let's do it. Mm. And you can make people happy. Um, and that's quite nice. And when you become a parent and just kind of moving on to the whole like transition into pharma, life completely turns upside down and you don't actually know what that <laughs> upside down is going to look like, feel like, 
<laughs> you can't even envisage what it's gonna yeah you just it's it's wild yeah it's it's hard for me to explain because you had a nice i assume you took a whole year for the to both those maternity leaves yeah so on mine when i lived in abu dhabi i had six weeks and went back to night shifts day shifts weekends so lily went to nursery full time and then with Kai, I had the plan to take the whole year, but I ended up only taking five months, which felt incredible compared to six weeks. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed being at home with him and spending time with him. But I also had super focused time to spend on the podcast, yeah. which lit me up. And when you're passionate about something and you enjoy something, you will make the time to push forward with it yeah. is what I've started discovering about myself and if it doesn't feel like work you will want to constantly do it yeah and the amount of times like I would get him down for a nap and immediately hop on to a laptop to work on my website and kind of build the brand um you know this is two years ago yeah um and, and kind of keep things that momentum going and I was really inconsistent with weekly episodes being released mm. and one of my goals was like let's figure out a plan to get that consistent content out there and the maternity leave obviously really helped me to be able to say to Sanjay like oh can you parent while I record yeah. an episode then while he's napping I can um do all the editing and right before I gave birth I think I recorded 12 or 13 <laughs> episodes in those last two weeks <laughs> on my mat leave just before I gave birth and then I all I had to do was edit in the background which was really useful so it's it's really nice to 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 learn that you did a lot of reflecting on your maternity can you go into detail a little bit about what were your thought processes what what were you thinking about when you were on your mat leave so I think I'd got to a point this is so Josiah was my is my second child so I'd done my first mat leave I'd I I sort of did the whole this is your first child you really fully em embrace it and 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 that kind of thing. And then when I had Josiah I just felt at that time something was missing for me. Um and I I think the where, where where I probably went back to that entrepreneurial thing there was something in me that was I wanted to do something for for myself I wanted to build something for myself because I'd had the two children and I thought there's nothing I'm giving all the time I'm giving to my kids I'm giving to my husband but what's what's mine what what can I build that's mine yes I've, I've birthed two children into this world but I did I, I felt I started feeling, feeling like I was like losing myself a little bit and I'd always been quite creative anyway, but I wanted to just do something different. And that was what I was reflecting on whilst I was on maternity leave. Like, what else, what else could I do? What else, what else, whether that's within pharmacy or outside of pharmacy, there was just something that was niggling. And I, we I talked about following your gut before, and it was just something in me was, I just, there's something else. Um, so, yeah, I, I, um, <laughs> In the in the moments of sleep deprivation, <laughs> whilst being um, on mat, mat leave, um, I would spend a lot of time watching craft TV. <laughs> and while well, while Josiah was sleeping, I'd be watching craft TV and and looking at all these different different machines and things that were on 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 TV. And at the same time, a friend of mine had also just had a baby, and I remember. Wanting to f find a card, it was a Nigerian, a Nigerian um, friend. I remember wanting to find a card that would really resonate with her culturally, and I couldn't find anything anywhere. I couldn't find anything on the high street. I couldn't find anything online. And I really love African fabric, as you can tell. <laughs> um, and I thought, oh, why, why don't I just cut a little baby buggy um, out of some fabric? put it on some card, write some, I think I wrote, um, welcome to the world little one, something like that. And I put it together and I gave it to her and she really liked it. And I thought, oh, that's, you know, maybe there's something, something in this. 
Um, and it was just from there, there's just this, this excitement and this buzz that I was going to start making cards. And it was never going to be at the beginning. It wasn't a business. It was just, I'm just going to start making cards for friends and family and, and, and do that. Um, but then it quickly turned into something else. And when my turn, my, when my son turned one, he's, he was one just before Valentine's Day and I'd made a load of Valentine's Day cards. And I set up a table at the back of his first birthday party and sold Valentine's Day cards <laughs> at his birthday. And they all sold out. And yeah, it just... Oh, <laughs> this is cool. This is cool because, like, there's a million things that this is cool. <laughs> because you just utilized a little bit of creativity in you, which is exactly what the podcast feels like for yeah. me. It, it's that, it's it's creativity for me. It's building something from scratch that is my own, that brings me a lot of joy. Yeah. And that kind of finished product that then goes onto Spotify and onto YouTube. Yeah. Like I've made that, obviously, in combination with a guest, but <laughs> I've made that and with Sanjay's help with the videography, it's like it's like a piece of art for yeah. me. And when you create something from paper, because I love arts and crafts, like Lily and I have spent endless amounts of hours. She's very arty because yeah. I've just exposed her to it her whole life. Um we we do so much kind of creative design. Even all of the background of my office upstairs is all her pictures and paintings and things. Um, we we just really enjoy it. It passes the time, and you actually don't realize the time that's passing when you're mm. doing it. But when you give it to someone, and they know it's been handmade by you, and you just see their eyes light up and just their smile. Yeah. That actually, do you know what? You're kind for creating something beautiful for me and it's a memory for them yeah. especially when it's a birth because it's something they'll potentially save it's yeah. like the one or two cards that you save when you've you know yeah. I don't save all of my cards when I'm given things for my kids birthdays or when they when I gave birth but there's a few things that I keep and if I had received a handmade card that's something that would resonate with me and just mm. want me to kind of cherish it yeah and that feeling that you get as an entrepreneur and then selling them you're like, oh, <laughs> this is something. There's something in yeah, this. Yeah, there's something in this. This is a side hustle idea, like <laughs> boom. Um, and I love that because you kind of just created it when you had the freedom and space yeah. to allow yourself. And then maternity leave allows us to do that yeah. in some ways. Yeah. A lot of parents do get super immersed into mum life. And of course, why not? And enjoy it if that's who you want to be. But if you're the mum like me who doesn't actually like to just parent yeah. and have a sense of purpose elsewhere which is why the podcast was really useful for me um it's nice to enjoy yourself and immerse yourself in mm -hmm. that as well so that must have been something really nice and creative for you to enjoy like yeah, whilst you're parenting I, I think so and and I think we spoke about it earlier so my with a, with my eldest she was quite full on so I did I guess I didn't really have the time to think about anything else because she was a full-on child. I was literally 24-7. Whereas with Josiah, he slept for longer. He Angel baby. <laughs> he just gave me that time to be able to have the time to think about, you know, other things. So, you know, that's probably why I spent time watching QVC and and craft TV and all those kind of things. And 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 that's how I sort of had the opportunity to think about, okay, be creative and 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 you know make that first card that was probably think about really, really rubbish. <laughs> and she was probably just indulging me. Um but Actually, it was the start of 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 something else, and I I always say that this business is my is my fourth child because it it literally is. I birthed it and nurturing it and and all that kind of thing. I like that. I like that idea. Actually, <laughs> I should say it's my third child. Podcast. Oh, I like that. Um, so tell me what it's it was like. We're going to go back to Novartis, but I do want to learn about your kind of mindset with regards to becoming an entrepreneur alongside working and how your business has actually developed it would just be interesting I'm curious to know yeah. it's been eight years right um what what's it been like over the last few years in terms of building it, it hasn't been easy um 
But I think like you, when you have a passion for something, you just make it work because you love it so much. And so when I I started um, the business whilst I was on maternity leave with, with Josiah and then went back to work, handed in my notice within a week and not know, like I said, not knowing what I was going to do. I was just going to locum and then think, okay, I'll locum and try and build the business as I, as I go through. But as life would have it, I had a mortgage to pay. I had a ch- child that was in private school and I needed, we need, I needed to find money. I needed to have money to, to pay all those things, to pay for the lifestyle that, you know, I'm so fortunate to have. And so with me handing in my notice and then speaking to um, my colleague about potential opportunities, um, I then ended up getting the job in Novartis. And so that was the, the life was then, okay, I still want to build the business, but I also need to build my career. I've also got two young children. So how am I going to do all of that? What was great about the Novartis role was that it was field based so I could work from home. And so I wasn't having to commute into an office every day. I could work again, manage my own time, um, but work in the comfort of uh, of being at home, which is different to when I worked at, uh, um, in the offices um, in Southwark with the CCG. I very much had to, you know, do the nine to five and then go and pick up the kids from school. And a lot of it was out of the house and all commuting and then having to pick up the kids. I didn't have that time at home. Whereas moving into a field based role, you know, I had that time in the mornings. I had that, I didn't have to worry about a commute. And so that gave me a bit more time. I then had to think about, okay, I'm I'm moving into a new sector, which also needs a lot a lot more sort of brain power because I'm learning something completely new. And so at that time, that was when I really started thinking about productivity and how do I make sure that I'm giving enough time for everything. Um, and it was just putting little th- simple things in place, waking up early. I'm a, I'm a mo- early p- morning person. I'm a, f- I'm a 5 a.m. girl. That's me. Oh, I love it. <laughs> We have so much in common. I love a 5 a.m. start. I have been struggling with it over the last year because Kai is so cheeky and wakes up at night and I wants to have fun. But if I have a good day, then a 5 a.m. start before the children are awake is kind of my best time yeah. to be productive. And even if it's just I do my yoga, my journaling, my um, meditation, I mean, that's perfect. Yeah. But there are some mornings where I'm like, boom, get on the laptop and do like one hour of solid work, which would I'd be more productive in that time than I would at 4 p.m. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I think that's so for me, waking up early gave me enough time to do all those things, to do some work on the business, to then take the kids to school, not having to do a commute or anything and then be able to come back and start work at nine o'clock. And then. If I need, then needed to do a post office run, for example, I've got my lunch break, I can quickly go out, come back and then work, go and pick up the kids. And then I would, I always say I, I did, I run Afro Touch in three hours a day because that's from the time the kids go to bed. So at the time it was around, they don't go to bed on time now, but it was around about 7, 7.30. So between 7.30 and say 10.30, that was my Afro touch time. So that was where I was, you know, making the cards or, you know, writing emails that would be then scheduled for the next day to be sent out to different shops and things to get, get business. So it was very much scheduling time and sticking to that that mm-hmm. time because being a mum working and running a business, it's it's hard, but it's, I always say it's hard, but it's not impossible. And because I wasn't, I wasn't at that time when you're, when you're running a business, I couldn't just give up my job. I've never these people that say, well, you know, starting this thing and just going to give up my job. I just didn't, I didn't, I wouldn't have the luxury of that because I had fees and, and, you know, mortgages and all that kind of thing to pay for. So I just made it work and it's it's literally waking up early, 
finishing at 10.30, 11 o'clock, going to bed. Not always, because sometimes I would have to do nine to five, five to whatever o'clock in the morning, because I might have an order, a big order that's come in that I need to do it. Um, but that was just sort of how I, how I managed things in, in the early, early days. Side hustle life. <laughs> Side, oh, I've been there. Side I'm still hustle there. life. <laughs> what am I saying? I've been there. I'm still there. I'm still side hustling. But like, it's, um, it is tough, but it's completely doable. It's doable. I think people don't realize how much time that they truly have. Yeah. And I always say that audit your time, like whenever I speak to students as well, audit your time for a week every single yeah. hour of the day and then just see where are you wasting time where could you be more productive where could you wake up 20 minutes earlier or um go to bed a little bit later <laughs> um just to kind of fill in the gaps yeah. now i'm not i'm not trying to recommend staying up till 2 a.m and and kind of doing your side hustle that way in fact i'm saying avoid that at all cost mm. Um, for me, it was either the early mornings um, because I had an hour and a half commute every day. That hour and a half, I would kind of have um, very specific activities to do for the podcast, whether I wrote my show notes, whether I was researching people that I wanted to come onto the podcast mm -hmm. through social media, whether I was creating social media posts, I might be emailing people, I might be on Canva creating YouTube thumbnails and social media posts. Um, I might be working on my website and keeping it updated. So all in all, each week, even now, I'm probably spending at least 10 to 12 hours a week working on Pharmacist yeah. Diaries. It used to probably be six or seven hours when it was audio only, but with the video element plus the brand has developed significantly. Yeah. I've now got the website up and running. I do free masterclasses. I'm having one-to-one -one conversations with so many more people. Um, I'm working behind the scenes on projects which haven't been launched yet. Mm. So it does take a considerable amount of time. And then on the weekends, um, Sanjay and I just talk to each other about what we need to do. Yeah, He has to edit all my content outside of his full-time job. So I need to give him time to be able to mm. do that. So maybe on a Saturday morning, I would take responsibility for both the kids and he would have quiet time to get the podcast done. And then maybe when Kai's napping, because he still sleeps two hours, three hours a day, I would just let Lily watch a movie on yeah. TV and jump on my laptop to be able to do what I need to do. And outside of that time, because I'm not super keen that she watches loads and loads of TV <laughs> or on screens... You know, we would make sure that we're doing things as a family, spending time outdoors, um, being creative together, arts and crafts, yeah. or just doing fun stuff yeah. in the house, spending time with my parents. Um, so she's not constantly just watching TV to allow me to work because yeah. that concept doesn't sit right with me either. Yeah. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. Sometimes, right? um, you know, they've got to sit on that, that iPad for, you know, 30 minutes, just yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> even just to give you some time. Agreed. <laughs> so, you know... Uh, I do. Even to this day, she's nearly seven and she she's allowed to kind yeah. of have that TV time or she comes onto the iPad and does some uh, fun apps and, yeah. and plays whilst I'm working. Um, and it is doable. I think the transition from going to kind of a full time pharmacist to a full time entrepreneur takes a lot longer than people would yeah. like. And it is really a long game. I'm four years into it. Mm -hmm. And only in November when I did quit my job and I'm in that locum world now, I'm finding it really hard. Financially, it's really hard. Yeah, I've got £1,500 a month going out for childcare fees for nursery. And you have to not only pay your mortgage and your traditional bills, but you've got this massive amount of money coming out to allow you to work as a parent, um, but also allow you to chase your dreams. Yeah. Um, which hopefully will turn into a life that I intentionally want to lead <laughs> and not be trapped by a nine to five. Yeah. Um, but it has been a, a, a real challenge to yeah. make that work for me. But I'm quite determined and I'm going to keep going with it and I'm really excited about it. Um, and there's a lot of people who do follow me that are entrepreneurs. So it's um, I think it's really useful information to, yeah. to share with them that you can find pockets of time and with very kind of good concentration in that time and a dedicated kind of task list yeah. of these are the things I need to complete within the hour, you feel quite fulfilled yeah. knowing that you've got all of those things done, even if they feel like all you have to do is send five emails.
yeah, yeah. It, it's 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 a different there sensation. Is, I I always there is always time. I think it's just how we choose to use that that time. I'm I'm one for that power hour where you just you know lock yourself in, and just you know do the things that you need to do within that hour. And it, and even if it is just the one hour that you have a day, that's one hour that's closer moving you closer to you know that whatever dream it is that you have. But yeah, I'm 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 very much a productivity girl and it's you know making sure that whatever time I have that I know what I'm going to be doing within that time that's going to be you know you know worthwhile um because yeah having a household with with three kids and <laughs> and still working I, even to, to today I you know I've I, although I've dropped um a day I still work four days a week um, still running the business and still doing all the other projects that that I do, but I now I've I because I've been doing it for the last sort of eight years. I've got processes in place that I know how to I know how to do it, and I know if I'm getting to the point where I'm feeling like a little bit burnt out, I know what to do to kind of pull myself mm. back. So it's a it's a it's been a, a learning process. So there's less of that working till three, four o'clock in the morning now because I've got automations and processes in, in place that make that process easier. Amazing. And when you first started out, I assume you were probably selling to family, friends, and it was word of mouth that got your brand name out. How did you then transition into um, talking to like corporates and businesses to to sell your products? So initially, after I'd sort of done... I, I did the table at the back of my son's <laughs> birthday party and then I set up an Etsy shop cool. um, and sold on Etsy for a little while and then quickly realised actually I need my own presence so built a website through Shopify and started selling through the website. But very early on I knew that I wanted to, my mission was always to create a buying option on the high street or online for people looking for culturally reflective cards. And the only way that I was going to be able to do that was to reach out to stores and shops and things like that. So I remember, although I, I started the business in 2016, I did my first um, trade show, which is which which was called Pro Progressive Greetings, which is an international greeting card um, trade show where all buyers come and sort of look for new new products. I did that in 2018. Um, and I had a couple of stores that had been interested previous to that. So I was already selling to uh, some smaller independent stores. But Progressive Greetings was um, a platform that enabled the brand to, to, to kind of get out there a little bit more. And actually, I forgot to say, I, I started the business as Special Touch Design. That was what it was called at the beginning. And I was special touch design for sort of the first three years. And then in 2019, I rebranded to Afro Touch Design. And the reason for that was because at that time, I'd been running the business for three years. I knew that the, I knew the, who I was trying to serve. And I knew that everything that I designed had that Afro touch. And so that was why I then rebranded to Afro Touch. Um, and have been have been Afro Touch ever since, um, but yeah, I'd always had that had it in mind that I wanted to be able to sell to shops, um, and so I did that alongside. So I had the wholesale side of the business, and then the retail side of the business, which is directly to um, customers through the through the website. And it was very slow to begin with, really, really slow. Um, I think with anything, just trying to get your brand out there, take it takes time. Um, but I quickly jumped onto Instagram. I think Instagram was was new at that at that time. So I used to just post pictures of the cards, post thing, post pictures of me making the cards because you couldn't do video at that time. I don't think I can't remember. But I used to just put products and things onto the onto the um, onto Instagram, and it just sort of people started started to know who who Special Touch or Afro Touch was at that time. And yeah, I as more and more people started hearing about the business through word of mouth, um, through the trade shows, trade show magazines, and it did a little bit of advertising and that sort of thing early on. Um, 
yeah, it grew, it grew from there. And then it slowed again. So it was always up and down, up and down. And then we got to 2020. And at 2020, I said to myself, if this is either going to be the year that's going to, I'm going to carry on, or I'm going to let it go. And I remember thinking to myself, I'm going to put, I put in this plan called Operation 2020. Ooh. And I was going to be stocked in, the, the plan was I was going to be stocked in 20 stores by the end of 2020. And got into 2020, was sending loads of emails out, January, nothing. February, nothing. Then March, we went into lockdown. And I thought, oh gosh, what am I going to do now? But but actually for an e-commerce business, for lots of e-commerce businesses at that time, because people were at home, people were jumping online a lot more. People were being, were, were, were sort of more engaged in the online space. And so we then sort of went through the sort of beginning bits of not really knowing what we were doing. We were in lockdown and then May happened and the whole George Floyd situation happened. And it just seemed like everybody then became socially aware. And, you know, the whole Black Lives Matter movement happened. And everybody was, you know, wanting to support black owned businesses and, and that whole piece. And it was at that time that I had an email drop it land in my in, um, in my inbox. And it was the buyer from Waterstone Bookshops. And I remember that um, she wrote a whole um, message around looking at Afro Touch cards, really liking them. Would I be interested in stocking Waterstone bookshops? So I remember saying to her, if this is real, here's my number, give me a call. <laughs> I don't know if this could be spam. So she phoned me and we had a long conversation. I remember saying to her, I make every single card by myself. My cards are hand finished. So every single card is individually made. And although I've stocked stores, you know, they've been smaller numbers. So I said, what, do you, what, what is this, what the volume is going to look like? And she said, oh, you know, well, we've got 220 stores. <laughs> Um, you know, across the country. And, you know, we regularly order. So I'm quickly doing the maths in my head. And my mum always said to me, say yes and work it out afterwards. Oh, I like that. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let's do this. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I worked with um, with Waterstones and I remember they they sent me the first purchase order and it was for thousands of, of cards. <laughs> I had to had to hand finish, um, but that was my first sort of um, major contract with a with a retailer, and then I entered a um, what they call the Henry's Awards, which is sort of the Oscars of the greeting card industry, and you had to submit your cards um, to be for di- in different categories, and I didn't didn't get selected, but the judges are buyers for different oh my different gosh. shops. This is so cool. <laughs> so um I had a hit kind of I had a hit list of of where I wanted to be stocked. And I remember putting, you know, Olivia Olivia Bernays, John Lewis, Waitrose on this list. And I had in my mind, I had a business coach at the time and and she said, you know, reach out to people on LinkedIn. So I was so I sent an email, I'm sorry, a, a LinkedIn message to the buyer of John Lewis. And she messaged me out. She said, oh, I've been meaning to get in contact with you. And she said, oh, we saw your cards at, that you submitted at the Henry, Henry's Awards. Um, we would really like you, we would really like um, to stock your cards. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, within a year, um, I stopped John Lewis and Waitrose, still single-handedly making these cards. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> and yeah, and um, I remember the Christmas, they usually give you give you the purchase order in the October. And so Christmas, I had the family, the kids, hubby, friends, just all helping me like, make these cards. And then the order went out in the order went out in, in the January 
And I remember just sitting on the stairs when they I saw the, the, we had this whole palette of cards that went out. And I just sat on the stairs and I just cried my eyes out. Aww. Because I was, because it, at that moment it was, this was always a, a dream in the back of my head. I didn't know that this was ever going to be a thing. And I remember just sitting down wanting to, to, ensure that there were cars on the high street that were culturally reflective that would resonate with people and now there's this crate leaving my house and it was funny because it was this massive we we lived on a little <laughs> a little um cul-de-sac and this massive truck came to the house and I had this tiny little little drive I was like how are they going to get this how are they going to get this crate on and just that emotion of it all I just sat on my stairs and did I you record cried. that I didn't actually know. Oh I know I didn't. I didn't. I was just, I'm mean, just, just feeling that. Oh. It's burnt into your memory. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's just, it's gone, gone from there. And then, fun, funnily enough, um, I then got another call from the TK Maxx buyer, and she said, "Oh, we've been in John Lewis, and we've seen your cards on the stores. Would you be interested in stocking TK Maxx?" And yeah, it's just... This it's, is so amazing. <laughs> it's Congratulations. Gone, thank that is you. really exciting. Thank you. This idea, the one card of the pram <laughs> with a little bit of like, you know, African fabric yeah. has grown eight years later. Eight years later. Into an incredible side hustle business. Like, this is cool. <laughs> I love that we get to showcase this on, on Pharmacist Diaries because... Probably you are utilizing some of your pharmacist skills, maybe a lot of the kind of leadership, project management, problem solving, communication, a lot of it does um, intertwine with entrepreneurship, which mm -hmm. I love. Um, but your personality obviously shines when it comes to making those connections in terms of networking. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've never met each other before and here <laughs> we are having fun together. Um, and and LinkedIn as well, like what a powerful place. Yeah, um, and I didn't know about any of these trade shows or like award ceremonies, uh, award ceremonies with cards. This is cool. Yeah. <laughs> I had no idea these things existed. Did you know? I had no idea. Wow. I, I didn't know anything about the greeting card industry. This is cool. Um, there's a... Um, an organization called the Greeting Card Association. So when I started, I think about six months into it, I joined the Greeting Card Association because I didn't even know what you put on the back of a card. I had to have a barcode and all different things, elements, yeah. and I just didn't know. In order to sell them to shops, I didn't know what that looked like. So I joined the Greeting Card Association and that really helped um, me sort of learn, you know, the industry and what, what, was, what was needed. And then that opened up the world of okay there's trade shows and there's magazines that you can advertise your products in and mm. you know different different people um and actually recently last year I became a um a council member so I'm now one of the council members of the greeting card association and I kind of represent diversity inclusion and and that kind of thing just trying to um ensure that you know we're thinking about diversity and inclusion in the within the industry yeah. but who knew that the greeting card even had its own you know yeah. industry but again, like when you look at, I mean, greeting cards and being an entrepreneur and running a business is completely different to pharmacy, but being on a, on a board or, you know, sharing your opinion and giving you advice, things that we do in pharmacy all the time. <laughs> yeah. It's like doing your pharmacy job, but in a non-pharmacy yeah. way. That's quite cool. I like that. I like the, the kind of like comparisons as well as the similarities. Um, where can people find you on uh, your website? So the website is uh, afrotouch.design um, that it's and it's afrotouch design on there across all, all platforms so the products are sold um, through the website but also you know they're, they're you probably most likely to find them in one of the shops that's that's near near to you they're now stocked in uh, Sainsbury's and Tesco's and, and different some of, the, some of the grocers so yeah great and don't forget everybody your 15% discount with Farm 15 P-H-A-R-M 15 <laughs> your kind offer from Georgina take it um that's amazing I, I love that story and I'm so happy for you Thank I'm you. I'm happy that you found your passion and you found joy and you probably learnt so much on this journey so uh that's incredible but um back to Novartis now 
<laughs> we haven't even got into that. We haven't even got into that. God knows how many minutes we've been recording. I, I haven't looked today. Um, I do want to get into that because I'm really excited to hear a about the role itself. Um, but also, can you tell me a little bit about how you felt like your skills from hospital and kind of primary care fit in? to that role because when we look at people who might be watching or listening to this episode yeah. people like me even who are going through uh, really quite intense transitions at the moment mine is very similar to yours it's related to parenting it's a little bit related to boredom and wanting more variety but also it's the flexibility piece that allows me to be the best version of me as a parent mm. and actually parenting has to be my number one priority yeah. and work comes next and I've kind of always been on the on the flip side of that where work has always been a priority and Liliana has kind of fit in alongside that and now with Kai in my life I mm. realized a, a, it's a lot more important for me to spend more time at home and be present in a positive way not an impatient tired <laughs> you know like overworked mum um and I'm trying to make that transition I'm finding it really hard and trying to get that balance um but it'd be really nice to understand um what skills you think are valuable from from kind of primary care and hospital into yeah. into that role I think the major one at the time was just the knowledge of the NHS. Okay. Um, having an understanding of the different elements of, of the NHS, how funding flows work and all that sort of thing. Having worked um, in kind of the CCG, I had that, that knowledge of that. Even just the simple um, skills around problem solving, around critical thinking, around strategic thinking, we often don't think that we have those things as pharmacists, but we we do. We, we, we're we utilising those things on a daily basis. And those were the sorts of skills that the, the pharma were looking for. They were wanting somebody that had an understanding of the way medicines work within the NHS. How do you get something through a drugs and therapeutic committee? How do you get, you know, how do you, how do pharma interact with medicines management? Um, you know, who are the key players? Who are the people that they need to, we need to speak to? What are the things that are important to the NHS at the moment? What are the therapy areas or, or the, the things that, you know, as a pharma, pharma organization, we need to be on, on, on top of. And so having worked in that environment, they were able to tap into that, that the value that I could, I could bring to, to the organization. So it's very much around, you know, that, that kind of strategic critical thinking piece. Um, but just, just you know, the the, the day to day pr problem solving, which which I think was 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 key. Um, I went into a, like I said, I went into a patient access manager role, which was, as it says on the in the title, it was how do you ensure that people are able to access the medicines that our organisation um, pr um, produce. Um, and how do I support the environment, so the NHS environment, to enable that access? So a lot of my work was around looking at potential projects, so projects that um, at the time I worked with in ophthalmology. So it was around how do I support ophthalmology services, um, improve efficiencies and things like that to support access to, access to treatments. And that's still a lot of my role now. I work as a strategic account manager. Um, within London, so I kind of cover the whole of of the south South London, um, and a lot of that is for me what 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 I love about my role, um, and this is how I, I kind of bridge the gap between the greeting card industry and what I do now. A lot of the work that I do is around access to treatments and looking at health inequality and how do we. Um, support access to treatments for those at the greatest need of ill health um, and particularly those people that are at the margins. So I go in and talk to um, kind of senior leaders within the NHS around what are they doing in terms of health inequalities, um, what service provisions require potential pharma, pharma support. That is a win-win a, a for, for everybody. 
but you know I've been working on on projects that have taken you know um buses that support screening um into local communities um I've supported projects that have looked at helping with health literacy and health education through my role um, as a strategic account manager. And I think one of the reasons why I stay in the role is because that's something that gives me me purpose. Um, and I, I'm, always, I'm a type of person that fairness and justice and equality is really important to me. And so I always try and instill that in any role that I do. Um, and so the work that I do within Novartis is very different to your kind of traditional pharma role, but it's a lot of it is around project management and and, and that piece. Um, and again, the skills that I have, the skills that I've developed within pharma, I'm also utilising in my AfroTouch world and vice versa. Um, sort of the marketing and that side of things from the, the business, I can bring that into my day-to-day, the day-to-day role as a, as a strategic account manager in pharma. I love that. And you seem really happy. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> heard the word bored and I'm sure no. you wouldn't use it because you're currently in the job anyways. And you never know, someone from your team might be watching. But, um, you know, it's nice to see, it's really nice to see the transitions you've made because there's several transitions, yeah. really different environments, really different skills, uh, really, yeah, really different skills. Um, so it's really interesting to see how it's all kind of molded for you. Yeah. Do you I've... feel like now you've got really good balance because you're doing four days of work and then you get one day to work on your business and and also enjoy your free time as well. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's now that, like I said before, now that I'm in the know of it all, it's a lot. It's a lot easier. Um, I feel that the kids are a lot older now, so they're a little bit more independent. So I don't have to do as much for them as I would have when I when I was first starting. So it gives. The, the time element is a lot lot easier now. Um, I'm fortunate enough to work for an organisation that, you know, supports what I do. So I've always been very transparent about what I do. And that's not always the case for, for, for everybody. In some organisations, you know, people often hide what they do or hide their kind of entrepreneurial desires because the organisation... Um, doesn't necessarily support support them but um the organization that I work with is you know very open to what I do um there's no conflict of interest um a completely different industry so um it it works and I've I have a really supportive team within my organization so that really does help and that's not like I said that's not always um the same for for everybody um but I think and that's also one of the reasons why I, I stay in my organisation because they are very much sort of family focused. They really, really ensure that you are you are your whole self um, and that helps. So, you know, I always say when you're looking for an organisation to work with, one of the, it's not just about the role that you look for. You also have to think about the culture of that organisation. So you can, if you, when you're looking at the, the, um, the, the business or the organization it's what what how do they support their their staff how do they support um what's the, what does the culture look like in terms of if you're starting out or if you're if you've got a young family or if you're at a later age in your your career how does that organization support um the individuals because i think your working life is only one aspect of your life, but it's part of your life. So you need to make sure that, you know, when you're, when you're looking for those careers and you don't, you, you, it's, it's difficult. It's easy for me to say that now, this, this now, because I've, I've been through the journey, but I think it is really important. The culture of the, of the place that you're going to work in is something that you also have to, have to investigate, not mm. just, not just the role. It's quite hard to do that. Mm. I mean, I mean, I'm lucky we all are lucky as pharmacists, like now I'm locoming, I am exploring what organisations are like mm -hmm. and whether or not I would like to be employed by them permanently. Yeah, And this is part of my exploratory journey right now, not only because it allows me to have the flexibility, like this week is half term and normally I would be working full time and having to juggle mm -hmm. Liliana in multiple clubs or 
you know, utilizing my community or my parents to help with childcare or Sanjay and I would try and take days off to kind of support with um, parenting. But this week now I'm in locum life. Yes, it, the, one of the disadvantages is that if I don't work, I don't get paid. Mm. So I'm in I'm in a space now where this week, if I've not done any days of work, then I'm not going to get paid, which is a disadvantage. But at the same time, I don't really have to give them much notice. Mm -hmm. I'm literally like, I'm not working. Yeah. Like you won't find me at my desk today. <laughs> See you on Monday. And it, there's no ifs and buts around it. You don't have to negotiate or beg for the annual leave or look at the rota and see yeah. who can fill your roles. Because that, for me in the hospital, what was so hard was that I understand why they do it, but they say to you that actually, yes, if you want annual leave, somebody needs to cover your duties yeah. for that day. So you're having to find beg your friends basically yeah. to cover your ward or your clinics or meetings or dispensary slots or my clinical lead role um, and trying to get all of that covered. And even sometimes when I get all of that covered, I was still being told I couldn't have days off. Yeah. And as a parent, like it's so much stress trying to sort all of that out. And now I just, that whole kind of stress has been removed. Yeah. It doesn't mean that life is like, <laughs> all you know happy and fairy like right now and you know flying unicorns everywhere I do have other stress because of locum life like I've shared online that it does feel quite lonely because you're not fully integrated into a team you do your job and you go home and you do get treated like a locum because you're just the person who does the job you've been asked to do and you leave so you're not like an integral member of the team you've got no um, you feel maybe you've got no say in the strategy for the department yeah. or if there are things that kind of need to be solved, you don't always feel like you can put your hand up and say like, yeah. well, this doesn't sound right because you're still new and you're still an outsider to some extent. And part of that could be me and my, like it could be psych psychologically that's how I feel and mm. not actually what the team, I like how they portray me yeah, yeah. as a member of a staff. Um, if that feeling exists, sometimes I say, usually my gut's right. Yeah. And I am feeling lonely. That is a fact. I am feeling lonely compared to working at the Evelina, yeah. where I was so integrated into the team. You know everybody and you feel part of the family. So I, now I know, okay, locum life isn't for me permanently. Mm. It gives, gives me what I need in terms of time, but it's not giving me what I need in terms of um, reward. Yeah. So it's temporary and I got to figure myself out. Mm -hmm. um, and mum life does that to you. You've got to accept change um, in different ways yeah. as well and, and at different stages of that child, right? Um, so it's all good. Um, but I'm really happy to hear that you, you've got the kind of stability at the moment and you're happy with your routine. You know, your entrepreneur journey is flying and um, it gives me inspiration because obviously with <laughs> Pharmacist Diaries, I'm really early in the journey so it's nice to um hear a really positive story yeah, and, no, and I, one of success i think everything i always say everything has seasons so you go through i one of the things that i'm really i i, I prefer the fir, the, the term work-life harmony as a, as opposed to work-life balance i don't think you can have work-life balance because that means that everything's equal and you can't when you're when you're doing all the things you can't balance balance it there's you have to kind of harmonize it in a way and that for me means that sometimes my business needs to be 100 percent, and everything else has to step has to be secondary sometimes it's I've got to give the family has to have more of me than the business so it's it's trying to kind of harmonize that but also it's giving myself grace and and saying you know I can't be all things to all people all the time it's just not it's not possible and that's okay and I'm learning that I'm I'm still learning that as I go as I go through um but I but for me I I'm such a believer that you know we can do and be anything that we want to be if we have the passion and the drive to do it it doesn't matter your circumstance Honest, I truly believe it doesn't matter your circumstance. There's always a way. There's always a way that if you tap into that, and I'm a strong, I've got, I've got a very strong faith. So I always believe that if you if you do good, good will happen. And so 
that's always what's what kind of drives me and, and keeps me going. Even on the hardest days when I'm like, oh, this is too much. I want to give it all up. Actually, I remember the message that I get in my inbox from somebody or the picture that somebody sends me of seeing the card or their little girl holding the card and saying, oh, this, this, she said this looks like her. That's the thing that kind of keeps me, keeps me in it. Um, but yeah, I, I, I strongly believe that there's always enough time because we waste so much. And if you truly have a passion for something, there's always a way to make it happen. And the only, only person that's stopping it from happening is you. Oh, what a good way to end our <laughs> podcast episode with a with a nice little, you know, touch from 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 your heart as well. Like I love that. And I and I believe the same thing. Um even with this podcast it's not been an easy easy journey, right? There are ups and downs, there are seasons, there are moments in my kind of like life where I've gone all in and I'm spending 25 hours a week working on it and and at the moment I'm in a space where I'm struggling to do the basics. And it's just because you do have ups and downs in life and you've got to accept that. Yeah. But it's genuinely hard because I'm an all or nothing human. And I'm one of those people that likes to just go all in, yeah. but continue that momentum, which life doesn't allow me to do that, yeah. whether it's half term in my way or one of my kids is unwell or bank holidays always get my way. And I, ha I have to yeah. then be a parent when I'm like <laughs> wanting to work and, you know, uh, you know, illnesses in the family like or if my parents need support like I've got to you know like give time to them so um unexpected things yeah pop up right um but for me because I love doing what I'm doing and I genuinely love the community that I've got and yeah. serving people in pharmacy with content that is educational and inspirational and motivational um I, I have the drive. Yeah. So even if there are times where I'm tired, I never want to give up on yeah. this podcast. Like I'm all in already. Um, but there are times where I wish I could have a break. But then I tell myself, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> Don't do it. You know, you know, give yourself space and grace. Yeah. But also, you know, get back into the flow, which is good. Um, so for all of you kind of uh, watching this week's episode, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you're on YouTube, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Make use of your 15% discount, uh, Farm 15, on um, AfroTouch Design's website. Um, I also wanted to let you know that this week I started a new LinkedIn newsletter. So if you haven't checked it out, go to my LinkedIn page, which is Anisha Patel, and you will find a newsletter called Behind the Mic. I've decided to share everything behind the scenes when it comes to podcasting. So if you're interested in starting a podcast, you are interested in becoming a content creator, or maybe starting an Instagram page, and you want to learn about how to manage audio, video, how to write copy, how to market yourself, um... If you're specifically looking to build a podcast, then there's going to be amazing amounts of content from there, um, from myself, but also from my husband, who is a video videographer, photographer, and podcast producer. So we have loads of interesting information to share. So go and subscribe to the LinkedIn newsletter. And otherwise, have a wonderful day, and we will see you next week. <laughs>